In our Sadie's passage, again, every week we've started off just reminding ourselves of this, what Peter tells us. We have a prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you would do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And just let that metaphor of the light shining in a dark place just really sink in. The fact that if the Bible's right, we live in a dark, dark world. And it doesn't take much observation to realize that as we kind of look around at sin and the effects of sin that's uh, marked this planet, everything from the natural evils of things like COVID to all the political turmoil that takes place all over the globe and that we're reminded of more than, than usual now because of what's going on in the States. This is a dark world. It's a dark world that needs some type of solution and that solution has to come from outside of this world because the problem is the world itself, the sin that you and I carry in our sinful natures. And so Christ was that light, is that light that has pierced the darkness for us. And that light, the record of it, is his word. And so you carry around the most important thing in the world, God's word and his gospel, that light that shines in the darkness. So we've been going through in this whole series about where does the Bible come from? How has God preserved this light in the dark for uh, thousands and thousands of years? We looked at the Old Testament. We've moved on to the New Testament. And now that we've taken a real good look at the formation and the preservation of the Bible, as you and I know it, we're going to look at a couple of these extra topics here, especially this idea of the Apocrypha. But before we start, here's some words from 1 John. 1 John, one of my favorite, uh, most favorite letters in the New Testament. It's often called the letter of love because John says the word love so much in it per capita more than any other by, uh, word in more than any other uh, book in the New Testament. And this is what he says as he starts getting near the end of his book. He says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. And so John straight up tells us as Christians, part of our job as Christians is to test. We're not supposed to just accept everything that anyone says, but we're supposed to test things. And we're supposed to test anyone that says that they're speaking from uh, God. And how do you test them? What's the number one test is to see whether or not that spirit is acknowledging Jesus Christ coming into the flesh. Now, this phrase, Jesus Christ coming into the flesh, this is really a, a statement that means a whole lot more than just the idea that Jesus Christ was flesh, that he was a human being, right? We have got the whole gospel meta narrative packed into this. The idea that because our sins separated us from God, God came into this world as Jesus and took on flesh for yours and my sins. And through his death and his resurrection, we have been justified, declared innocent in God's eyes. And now Christ lives in us, that truth, right? So that idea, the whole kind of gospel point everything pointing to Christ as the solution to this problem that we've been talking about. If a spirit says they're from God and they're not about Christ, they're not pointing to Christ as our savior from sin, then we know we've got a problem. Then we know that uh, then your red, your radar should be going off, right? Red flags everywhere. And so the spirit of the antichrist, anti uh, before or against Right, the spirit of someone that's against Christ is someone that rejects this gospel message, a spirit that's already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to him. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us, right? 
Uh, whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So look at the claim that John is making here. All right, he's just said, if you want to know if something is from the spirit, you test it by seeing whether or not it's talking about Christ. All right, whether or not this is a message from God about God saving us through Christ. Now, what is John saying here? He says, we are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. So in other words, John is saying, we are that revelation I was just talking about. We are that testimony about Christ. In other words, if you want to test the spirits, you can test them by measuring them against what we say, because we are all about Christ. So this is just another clear point where John, as an apostle, is saying, he is speaking by the Spirit. In other words, he is speaking God's word. What he is speaking is part of God's revelation to us, the Bible. So that's John pointing to himself again as a writer with this authoritative testimony from God. And we can test John too. And I challenge you to do that. See whether or not John's writings are about Christ coming into the flesh. In fact, that's a very special phrase that we find in John chapter 1, verse 14, right? Uh, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. So we see marks of his gospel in John's letter here. Can you speak up real loud? Yeah, uh, yeah. So John 1, 5 uh, part of the section you just were talking about says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness is not overcome it. Yeah. First John 1 5 says, uh, this is the message we heard from him and declare to you, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. Yeah. I just think it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Like I just don't even think that's a coincidence. No. That John 1 5 and first John 1 5 are saying exactly the same thing. And a lot of our favorite metaphors that we find in John's gospel, they're present in John's letters as well. Yeah, there's very clear literary ties between the two. Yeah, where John talks about God and Christ in the, the same way in both. Yeah, and I love this idea of the light, right? Uh, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. Oh, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the same site location, Yep. In both. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, John's gospel too, or uh, the first epistle of John, the beginning, it says, right, uh, the, the darkness yeah. is passing, yeah. right? And the true light has come, right? Yeah. So all that very powerful language of light in the dark again. Yeah. So we test things. We test this. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Is it the same uh, John? Uh, is it the same John also appearing first John? Yes. John? So the writer of first John is the same John that wrote the gospel of John. Yep. So this is John the apostle who was one of the disciples of Christ. He was the youngest disciple and he also wrote revelation. So a good chunk of the new Testament was written by John the apostle. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And so again, we measure then whether or not something is from God by seeing whether or not it's about Christ if it points to Christ as someone who has come into this world to save us from our sins. So with that kind of in the background here, and we had these promises that God has given us about his word, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus answered, man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. With all that in the background, this is a Bernardo Strozzi painting of a famous scene from the healing of Tobit from the book of Tobit. So if you were to kind of Google apocryphal stories, uh, books from, or uh, apocryphal paintings, paintings from the books of the Apocrypha, this is a famous one that comes up quite a bit. It's from the book of Tobit. And in the book of Tobit, we find this passage that comes up. It is better to pray sincerely and to please God by helping the poor than to be rich and dishonest. It is better to give to the poor than to store up gold. Such generosity will save you from death and will wash away all your sins. Those who give to the poor will live full lives. 
but those who live a life of sin and wickedness are their own worst enemies. So Tobit is this story that has to deal with a man named Tobit and his, his uh, son as well uh, in this intertestamental period. And as you're kind of reading this, what do you think of this kind of statement about taking care of the poor? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Linda says she likes it. Why might you like it? I think we should help the poor. You say, I think we should help the poor. Agreed. Yeah. So great, great statement then, right? Everyone like it? Marion, but with helping the poor does not uh, give save you from death and will wash away all your sins. That has nothing to do with washing away your sins. Only yeah. Jesus can do that. Yeah, so look at that language right there in the middle. It's better to give to the poor than to store up gold. Why? Such generosity will save you from death and will wash away all your sins. Yeah, so this language of washing away of sins, that should really kind of make you a little iffy, right? Because we know that there is absolutely nothing we can do on our own to wash away our sins, right? Uh, nothing washes away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? Or what can wash away my sin, right? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And here in the book of Tobit, you have a statement that totally kind of rubs the wrong way there. So we can find every now and then statements like this throughout the Apocrypha where there are words, statements that are clearly contradicting what John just said earlier, right? That we need to look to Christ and that the message of the Bible is about Christ coming into the flesh to be our savior from sins. And so in the Apocrypha, we find sometimes contradictory doctrine to it. It's not all bad like this, just like we could take this whole paragraph here and, you know, I mean, uh, 80% of it's all right. You know, the first, you know, a couple lines and the last a uh, couple lines as well. It's just kind of right there in the middle that you've got a problem. We can look at the Apocrypha in the similar way where you could read most, most of it and there's a lot of good stuff in it, but then you're going to every now and then come across some stuff that's highly problematic. And so we can find things within it, just like I would imagine if you poured through enough of my sermons, you could find something in it where you would say, man, I'm not too sure if I like the way you put that Pastor Thompson. Why? because I'm not inspired. I make mistakes. I am not inspired by the Holy Spirit when I preach or when I teach. I make mistakes. And guess what? It was the exact same thing with the writers of the Apocrypha. And the Jewish people recognized this and knew this. And so this is what we're going to be talking about. This is the original King James version of the Bible, the 1611 one. This is one of the earliest uh, copies that we have. And if you notice there, taking a look at it, there's a top section called the Old Testament, right? A uh, number of their chapters, right? The Old Testament section up there. Then at the bottom, there's the books of the New Testament. And what do you have in the middle? The books of the Apocrypha. And so if you were to kind of zoom in and take a look at this, right there in between the Old and the New Testament, you've got First and Second Ezra, Tobit, Judith, the rest of Esther, the Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, which is a book of the Bible, Baruch, the Letter of Jeremiah, the Song of the Three Children, the Story of Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, the Prayer of Manasseh, and First and Second Maccabees. So uh, I've read the Apocrypha from start to finish once upon a time, but not for a while. So if you've got, you know, quiz questions about specific things here, I'm not going to be able to necessarily uh, uh, pull things together perfectly with it. Um, but those are the books of the Apocrypha. Every now and then you've got a couple that are added or subtracted based on some of the original kind of Jewish listings, but this was the listing that kind of was used by uh, any groups in the New Testament that were including the Apocrypha in their uh, transmission of the Bible. So where did this Apocrypha come from? After the last prophet of the New Testament, Malachi, after the period of the Assyrian defeat of Israel and then the Babylonian defeat of Israel, there's this period called the Babylonian captivity. After the Babylonian captivity, God allowed Israelites to go back and rebuild the temple. 
but when they went back and rebuilt the temple and rebuilt Jerusalem, they were still subjects of, of uh, Babylon at that time. So they were not their own sovereign nation when they were allowed to return and rebuild things. They were just allowed by the Babylonians to go back and reestablish their kingdom. Well, Babylon didn't stay in power for a whole lot longer. In fact, uh, someone came along a little bit later that did short work of that area of the world. That person was Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great famously conquers uh, just about everything in the known Western world at that time, including large sections of the Middle East at that point. And he came down and he defeated Israel as well and set that up as part of his kingdom. He also went up and defeated uh, great big sections of Turkey and Macedonia and things like that. And so established this huge empire. When Alexander died, his empire was then divided into four different kingdoms based on his four main generals. And each general took over a part of that kingdom. And so one of them then, the Seleucids, took over the kingdom of Israel and the neighboring countries as well. And so Israel remained under Greek rule for a very long time. After the Babylonian captivity, it then switched over to the Greek rule. Alexander's empire was huge, the way that it stretched out. You can see that it went all the way over into India. He famously uh, did battle uh, over there. Uh, but so all of Persia was under his control down through Palestine and Egypt as well, all of Asia Minor as well as uh, Greece and uh, that area. So huge, big empire. Once he took that over, then Palestine was under a new rule at that time. And so a lot of us maybe forget this, but there was a good 300, 400 year period where the Israelites were under Greek rule before the Romans come along. And so if we were to kind of look at this as a timeline, you've got there in that orange section to the left, the Babylonian captivity. And then you've got that blue dotted line that goes vertically there. That's the temple being rebuilt. So that's when Ezra, Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Zerubbabel, when they return back to uh, Israel and they rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so that's what start, what, that's what we call the second temple period at that point. Before that, it was the temple of Solomon, but the temple of Solomon got destroyed. When it got rebuilt, it got rebuilt as the temple, as the temple um, as the second temple, and it's actually going to be expanded on. We can actually talk about a third temple period if we think about Herod's expansions to it later on. So there's that Babylonian captivity. They return. Then there's that period then after the Babylonian captivity from the temple being rebuilt all the way down to uh, that blue section, the period of Jesus from birth to death and resurrection. You'll notice there's that red dotted line that goes vertically where it says Book of Malachi, circa 400 BC. So that's when Malachi was written. And Malachi is, for all intents and purposes, the last book of the Old Testament. That's the last prophecy that God gave Israel before Jesus was born. And so Malachi is where we have the really cool prophecies concerning John the Baptist and the way getting prepared for uh, Jesus. And so... There's that period then from 400 BC to the birth of Jesus, around 400 years when there are no prophets. There's no prophets. There's no new books of the Bible that are being written at that time. And you'll notice then in that time period, you've got Alexander ruling for a while, uh, then Antiochus. After that, the Maccabean independence. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. But you have then this big period where there are other rulers of Israel up to the point of Jesus. There's that Roman occupation. You see that at the bottom there, uh, slightly to the right there. That's when Rome comes in and begins to rule Israel. So from the point of the Babylonian captivity on, Israel had always been under control of other empires. They were never sovereign nations, except for a small year where it could be argued under the Maccabeans. So even though there's no new books of the Bible that are being written in this time period, did the Jewish people just stop writing? Did they say, we're, we're just not going to pick up a pen and a piece of parchment and do anything? No, they continue to write. They continue to 
uh, study their Old Testament and make commentaries about their Old Testament. They continued to write histories of what was going on. They continued to write their own stories and things like that. And so the most important of these stories and histories that were written in this time period were gathered together and they were called the Apocrypha. And so this Apocrypha then are these extra biblical sources written by Jewish people between Malachi and Christ coming. Okay. The Jewish people did not consider them inspired by and large. They did not consider them inspired, but they considered them important texts for their people especially the historical ones, because they covered things like, we're going to see the Maccabean independence, which is the basis of some stuff that you know about. So there's this 400 year period, books are being written. The most important of these are collected and they're appended then to some of the writings of the Jewish people because they're so important. Maybe think of this, um, if you've got a study Bible, especially if you got one of the new edition study Bibles, is just the Bible in there? What else is in there? There's sometimes introductory explanatory notes to the different books of the Bible. Um, sometimes in the back of them, in our Lutheran circles, we'll stick the small catechism, sometimes even the large catechism in there. Why? Because we think they're inspired? No, because they're important and they're useful for helping us understand the rest of it. In the same way, we can think of these books of the Apocrypha of things as writings that were appended by the Jewish people because they were important. They saw them as deeply valuable. So, the one thing that you probably know, if you know nothing else about this intertestamental period, the one thing you do know something about is this thing called Hanukkah, right? So, the Jewish celebration of Hanukkah is actually not based on anything in the Bible. It's instead based on events in the books of First and Second Maccabees in the Apocrypha. And so this is just, you know, a big kind of explainer picture showing the different things of Hanukkah. But you got that section, the spiel up there. And if we zoom in, uh, some of your friends celebrate it. Adam Sandler wrote a song about it. You even see decorations this time of year. But what exactly is Hanukkah? And so here's just, you know, a very simple description of it. Hanukkah is a Jewish holiday that honors a miracle that occurred during the rededication of the second temple in Jerusalem in 165 B.C. 165 BC. So what time period are we talking about? That intertestamental period between Malachi and Christ coming. A lamp with only one day's worth of oil was lit, yet the flame continued to burn for eight days and nights. This is why a candelabra called a menorah features eight candles. A new candle is lit every evening throughout the holiday, and games like dreidel are played, while songs like uh, Ma'ot Zur are sung. Hanukkah is also known as the Festival of Lights. So, at one point, the Israelites, they throw off their captive rulers. And uh, in the book of First and Second Maccabees, there's this revolt that takes place. And there's a struggle for their independence. And in the midst of that independence, this event takes place. And that's where the celebration of Hanukkah, Hanukkah comes from. So, Hanukkah is really a celebration of the Jewish people throwing off the chains of their Greek captors for a period at least. That's what they're celebrating is, is the battles and the war that take place in the first and second Maccabees and Judas Maccabeus, Judas the Hammer, and some of these great historic figures of the Jewish people in that intertestamental period. It's recorded in the Apocrypha. So we can see why books in the Apocrypha, like first and second Maccabees, are ridiculously important to the Jewish people. It is part of their history, and it's, for the most part, good, accurate recordings of what took place in those times in that intertestamental period. They have festivals based on these events. They have their own legends about some of the things that took place there. So that's at least a glance into one or two things that you might find in the Apocrypha. Any questions up to this point about the history of the Apocrypha? We'll start getting into why Christians later on started treating the Apocrypha like the Bible, at least some. But any questions about the history, where it comes from? All right. Sir, was the, yes, was the Apocrypha, was it all written by uh, the Jewish people? Yes. Yep. So it's all Jewish authors. Yeah. As far as oh. I know. Okay. Yep. yep. So the Apocrypha for the Jewish people 
It's a collection of books that they do not consider inspired by and large. I'm sure you can find Jewish people, a few Jewish sects here or there that did consider it inspired in some regards, but the by and large, the, the, the great amount of Jewish people in antiquity did not consider them inspired, but they considered them important. And so they appended them to things like their Septuagints. Later on though, we're going to see that the Apocrypha is gonna become a very confusing thing for the Christian church. And in fact, the Catholic church considers the Apocrypha in some regards as equal to the rest of scripture or as scripture. And so they consider it authoritative. Why? Why do the Catholics keep it? Why do they put this in their Bible? Here are some of the arguments that Catholics give for why the Apocrypha should be part of the Bible. The New Testament contains allusions to the Apocrypha, all right? So for example, 2 Maccabees uh, is alluded to in the Bible and Hebrews has some as well. So you can find allusions to the Apocrypha. They're very small. I think there's maybe three total in the entire New Testament, allusions that are made, but they're there, which tells you that the authors knew about the Apocrypha, okay? So if the New Testament is making allusions to the Apocrypha, Maybe one point in favor of it being inspired, says the Catholics. The Septuagint, they would say, which contains the Apocrypha, is most often cited by New Testament writers rather than the writer's own translation of the Masoretic text. So remember when we talked about the Hebrew Bible, of uh, the Masoretic text? So what this is saying is the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it was a Greek translation that was produced in Alexandria. Why was a Greek translation of the Old Testament produced? Because the Jewish people were spreading out outside of Jerusalem and outside of Israel to other parts of the world. And when they got to other parts of the world, they started getting rusty on their Hebrew. And so, for example, the Jewish people that were living in, uh, in Alexandria, in Egypt, at that time, they wanted a Bible that was in the Greek language, the language that was getting spoken in Alexandria. And so they translated the Old Testament into the Septuagint, into the Greek language. And the Septuagint then became widely used, extremely widely used. It was an important source text for the Jewish people. It was so widely used that when people in the New Testament quote the Old Testament, Sometimes they quote the Septuagint. So instead of having their own translations, they will quote, because the New Testament is written in Greek, they'll quote the Greek Septuagint. And they'll quote it even if there's maybe some discrepancies between the Greek and the original Hebrew, they'll still go with the Greek one. So it shows that the Jewish people really had high regard for the Septuagint. Now here's the thing. The Septuagint, when it was written and when it got circulated, the Jewish people would append to the end of the Septuagint, the Apocrypha, or some of the books of the Apocrypha. So they would send out the Old Testament, it would circulate this Greek Old Testament, it would circulate along with the Apocrypha appended to the end of it, okay? And so, Roman Catholics say, point number two in favor of the, of the Apocrypha being inspired. It was something that circulated with the Septuagint. We know that to the Jewish people. So we'll look at each one of these critiques in a bit. We're just going to kind of list out uh, the critiques before we get down to the nitty gritty. Catholic Church would say the earliest Greek manuscripts of the Bible contain some of the Apocrypha alongside the Old Testament books. All right. So we do have Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. So copies of the New Testament manuscripts in Greek that as they get circulated, they sometimes have the Apocrypha appended to the end of them. Uh, some of our most famous ancient copies of the New Testament have the Apocrypha appended to the end of them. In some places, the Apocrypha was included in congregational readings. So we know that there were some times in the early church when the Apocrypha was read every now and then in synagogue or in some of the early churches. Okay, So they're very few and far between, but we can find examples of that. Art in the catacombs in Rome reflect a knowledge of the Apocrypha. So when you look at the graffiti that's in the catacombs underneath the city of Rome, where the Christians, early Christians, were gathered together and kind of doing their worship in secret, you can find, for example, 
Uh, you can find, for example, graffiti or art of Jesus being baptized by John or whales signifying Jonah and things like that. You can find you know, these biblical scenes that have been painted or some way etched on the walls there. You can also find some apocryphal scenes on there as well. Scenes from the stories in the Apocrypha. Very few and far between, but they are there in the catacombs. So Catholics would say another point for the Apocrypha being uh, equal to the rest of the New Testament and Old Testament. Finally, the church fathers, even those that rejected their canonicity, made use of the Apocrypha in their preaching. Okay, so there were some uh, church fathers that rejected them as being part of the Bible, but yet they still cited it as they were preaching. Okay, so guys like Athanasius, uh, Cyril, Epiphanes, Jerome, these people did not think that the Septuagint was inspired or did not think the Apocrypha was inspired, but as they were preaching and doing their writing, they would sometimes quote from it. Okay, you tell me if you think that's a strong uh, case for it. And then finally, Augustine believed the Apocrypha to be canonical. All right, so Augustine is one of our big heavy hitters in the early church. Luther loved Augustine, used a lot of his theology as he was developing his idea of justification. And Augustine uh, thought that the Septuagint, or, that, or thought that the Apocrypha should be part of the Bible. And so we have records of this in some of the small councils that were taking place in Carthage, uh, the area where Augustine comes from. So those are the arguments for the Apocrypha being in the Bible as being equal to the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, why do Protestants reject it? Here's a few things that we can talk about. The Apocrypha contains unbiblical teaching, such as magical incantations, something that's never found in the Old Testament, prayer for the dead, and explicit salvation by works. So when you read the Apocrypha, like I said, 90% of it, is uh, just fine. You can even find a few very beautiful sections in the Apocrypha, but then you come across things that you're like, this just directly contradicts the rest of Scripture. This just has no place in something that you would call inspired. Things like magical incantations uh, and explicit statements of salvation by works, ones that aren't explained in any way, shape, or form. So you would say this person is, in fact, preaching salvation by works. All right. Uh, the other thing is the Apocrypha contains very clear historical inaccuracies. So there are historical books within it. Besides historical books, there are stories that are meant to be historically contextualized as well. And we can find a number of historical uh, inaccuracies, things within the Apocrypha that uh, clearly are, are bad records of, of you know, times and places and history and things like that. And that's widely acknowledged. Um, this is not as if there's a camp that says they're accurate and another camp that says they're not accurate. Anyone that studies it says, yeah, that, that's not right. Uh, the Apocrypha was widely rejected by the Jewish people before and during Jesus' time as equal to the Old Testament. All right, so by and large, the Jewish community themselves rejected the Apocrypha. Okay, they did not think that it was inspired. This goes for uh, discoveries at Qumran as well. Um, now, that doesn't mean that they didn't like the Apocrypha, just like we like the small catechism and the large catechism. We like them a lot. We think they are awesome, but that's very different than saying that they are canonical, that somehow they, they are inspired by God, every single word, and they belong in Scripture, right? Those are two separate things entirely. Uh, one example, Josephus, he's the most famous Jewish historian that we've got. Uh, he was a Jewish historian, but he was highly esteemed by Rome, uh, considered a great historian by Romans themselves. And this is what he wrote. He said, it's true, our history has been written since Artaxerxes, very particularly. So he's talking about books like First and Second Maccabees and things like that, but has not been esteemed of the like authority with the former by our forefathers. So the former ones would be the Old Testament books, right? The ones that we know. And he's saying that there have been histories written by us, but they don't have the same authority as the ones written by our forefathers. In other words, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. Why? Because 
there has not been an exact succession of the prophets since that time. What's he saying? He's saying after Malachi, no prophets. So the Jewish people, by and large, thought that there were no more prophets after Malachi. And if there's no more prophets, there's no more prophecy, right? There's no more books of the Bible. Um, and so that's what the Jewish people thought in general, that it had stopped after Malachi. And so these are great histories. These are great books. Uh, they are highly esteemed, just like we would say. Small catechism is highly esteemed, but they are not inspired scripture. Okay? So Jewish people did not think they're inspired, which is pretty important considering that they were written by the Jewish people. Okay? They themselves did not think that. A uh, couple more points. Pastor? Talk. Yes. Yeah. Can you just elaborate on a, a tiny bit more? So on, yeah. on, on what grounds did they not believe that they were inspired? Like what, what were the parameters? What were the, the, the factors that led them to hold that? Yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, bring up a couple of those. Uh, the big one is that the Apocrypha, none of the books claim to be prophecy. So they don't claim to be written by a prophet. Um, so they just recognize that people claiming to be sent by God to send prophecies to Israel, that that had stopped af after Malachi, um, that these books were just not claiming to be the types of things that the Old Testament books were claiming. That's the big one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, when uh, Old Testament prophecy books start, they say, you know, um, oh, give me some phrases from them. I'm drawing a blank here. Um, yeah, the word of the Lord came to me, right? The word of the Lord came to me. We see this all over the place in the Old Testament. You don't find language like that in the Apocrypha. Um, you don't find the writers uh, having angels put coals on their tongues and cleansing them and getting them ready to spread uh, God's prophecy. It's just a different type of thing that's taking place within them. If you read uh, some of those books, the Apocrypha, you'll, you'll notice right away that the style is just very different than Old Testament prophecy. Yeah. Well, to your point earlier, yep. I mean, there's work righteousness, uh, salvation by works. Yeah. Writings uh, and other things that don't substantiate uh, salvation through Christ and Christ alone. Yeah, so Jewish people would be able to write, recognize that there are doctrinal things that do not line up between the books of the Apocrypha, at least some of them, some of that material, and the Old Testament books, that there were things where things are kind of going off the rails a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're, yeah, good. Um, oh, here's that point. Right to your point there, Fran. So the Apocrypha rejects itself as prophetic Teaching prophecy ended with Zechariah and Malachi. So if you read, for example, 1 Maccabees, it makes reference in it to itself with the idea of prophecy ending with Zechariah and Malachi. So this was just something that the Jewish people generally recognized. No book claims to be prophetic. Um, so that's a big reason why the Jewish people would, would, would kind of say, it's a great writing, but it's not inspired. Uh, it doesn't claim to be. Um, how about this idea of the apostles quoting from it and things like that, or making references to it. Jesus and his apostles never treat apocryphal books as inspired. So although the New Testament contains allusions to events recorded in the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, which are a smaller subset of uh, books, it does not directly quote either of them. Okay? So just because there's allusions made to non-biblical books, does that mean that a person thinks that they're inspired? No, there's uses all the time that we have for making reference to non-biblical things to help with teaching, to maybe elucidate a point or something like that. Um, Pastor Getzinger and I, we quote all the time uh, non-Christian sources when we're giving sermons. Why? Just to kind of help with the teaching of the things that we clearly identify in our sermons as coming from God, right? So in the exact same way in the New Testament, uh, we can find allusions to non-biblical sources, um, but uh, the writers themselves make it clear what they think is scripture and what they think uh, and what they're just treating as something a little different. 
Uh, the church father's acceptance of the Apocrypha was not universal or clear. So citation of selected verses does not, did not prove acceptance of entire books as canonical. All right, so we said earlier, Augustine, this great figure of the church, he, we can find times where he writes and he says that the Apocrypha uh, is part of the Bible. Well, just because Augustine, and maybe we can find a few other church fathers, say that it's part of the Bible, does that mean it's part of the Bible? No. In fact, this is nowhere near a universal thing by the early church fathers. We have a lot of church fathers that say that the Apocrypha does not belong in inspired scripture. Uh, that, again, it's useful, it's highly esteemed, but it's not something that belongs in scripture. Citation of selected verses did not prove acceptance of entire books as canonical. So just because a church father might cite a verse of the Apocrypha does not mean that he thinks it's inspired for the exact same reason that um, if a Wells pastor cites something that's not in the Bible does not mean that it's not part of, or does not mean that he thinks it's part of the Bible. Um, how about those catacomb paintings? Um, it's interesting. It shows that the early church had a knowledge of the Apocrypha, right? A greater knowledge than you and I do. But catacomb paintings depicting apocryphal scenes do not prove the canonical acceptance of the Apocrypha, right? So just because they're painting scenes that occurred outside of biblical history does not mean that they somehow think that these belong as part of biblical history or as part of the Bible itself. Uh, maybe by way of analogy, here in town, St. Peter's Evangelical Lutheran, uh, this is down on Spark Street downtown here uh, in Ottawa. It's The church is a member of the ELCIC, but it's a very old church. And there they've got a stained glass window of Luther, right? And if you take a close look at that stained glass window of Luther, what do you see in there? You see him nailing the 95 theses and you see the Wartburg and you've got lots of phrases there from Luther. So they even uh, have some of his... Uh, uh, famous phrases at the bottom. You've got the just shall live by faith, right? Uh, which was um, one of uh, uh, Luther's favorite verses. At the top, you've got, if you look in the small corners up there, there's actually musical notation. And you've got music from A Mighty Fortress is Our God, right? That's up there as well. So lots of things. It's a beautiful stained glass window. So this church obviously thinks Luther and his writings uh, were inspired by God that Luther was a prophet of God and Luther's writings were equal with scripture, right? Because they've got a stained glass window. If they would go that far to make a stained glass window of Luther, they must think that he's inspired, right? That, he's, that he is one of the prophets or the apostles, right? No, obviously not. We understand that that's not the case in any way, shape, or form. It's put up there because we realize that the work of Luther is highly esteemed, right? That there is something very important about what he did. And it fits into salvation history, the work that he was doing, and it's deeply important. But just because you've got pictures of things doesn't mean that you think that they're somehow inspired, even when you go so far as to make stained glass windows of them and put them up in your church. We can find lots of Wells churches that have, uh, that have pictures of Luther in them and scenes from the Reformation as well. Um, virtually every Lutheran church has somewhere in it a stained glass window of Luther's seal, right? Um, this in no way means that we think Luther is somehow equal with the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's just highly esteemed, right? In the same way, finding a few pictures of the Apocrypha in catacombs under Rome, it doesn't tell us anything about what they think the canonical status of the Apocrypha was, just that they knew the Apocrypha. Um, inclusion of the Apocrypha in a separate section of the Bible uh, did not constitute acceptance of the Apocrypha as equal to Scripture. Apocryphal books were often simply used to fill up empty space at the end of codices. So when you put together a codice they were, uh, or a codex, they were put together in very similar ways that our books today are put together, where you would have, you know, uh, what is it? It's usually f uh, four pages four pages or eight pages that are folded and stitched together at the end, right? So if you're, you know, so that's the bundles and then you take these kind of bundles together and you put them together into a book, right? So if you do that and if you produce the book first, back then they didn't have printers and computers where they knew how long the text was going to be exactly. 
Instead, they would produce the book first, right, with all these things put together, and they would have an empty book then that they would then copy the books they would then copy into, right? So they didn't know when their writing was eventually going to run out. They had a rough idea, but they didn't know when it was going to run out. And so we know that at least some monks, uh, some scriptoriums, they would fill that empty space at the end of their copy of the New Testament. They needed to fill it with something, a super valuable paper. They needed to fill it with something that makes sense and that kind of fits with what they've got there. The Septuagint in the past would append, or uh, yeah, the Septuagint in the past would append books from the Apocrypha. Um, so why not put those in there, right? Um, so there was this tradition of sticking the Apocrypha at the end of some copies of the Bible. By no means is this universal. It's nowhere close to universal. The vast majority of books, of uh, copies of the New Testament, of the Bible in general, do not have the Apocrypha in them at the back when it comes to the earliest Christian church. But that doesn't mean that you can't find examples of it. And that doesn't mean that people that appended it to the end thought that it was scripture in the exact same way that if you pick up your Lutheran study Bible and it's got that small catechism at the end, does not mean that you think or that the editors of that Bible thought that that was scripture either. It's just important. Paper is rare. We're going to append something of value to the end here. Um, does that make sense? Now here's the reality. Numerous church fathers argue for the 22. That's our 39 Old Testament books. Okay, uh, this includes Melito, Origen, Hilary of Poitiers, Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem, the Council of Laodicea, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, Epiphanius, Rufinus, and Jerome. So you have lots, huge figures in the early church, equal to Augustine. There's no question about that as far as influence goes in the earliest church. Plenty of them that said straight up, the Apocrypha is not part of the Old Testament. It's not part of the Old Testament. There are these 22, our 39 books, and the Apocrypha is not part of it. You've got tons of people, uh, big church leaders that argued that in the early church. Now, that's very important. If you're arguing this with a Catholic or something like that, you and I, we would just straight up say, it's got unscriptural stuff in it. That's the main reason that we reject it. it it's just not revealing Christ in the way that John says in 1 John. Um, but we can look back historically and say, most of the early church did not uh, recognize the exact same thing as you and I. Uh, here's a good example of it. Jerome, and here's a, the famous painting of Jerome by Caravaggio. Jerome was the individual that translated the New Testament into Latin, uh, the most famous Latin translation that we had, the Vulgate, because the vast majority of people in the Middle Ages that were educated they didn't know Greek or Hebrew, but they knew Latin. And so, because that was the language of the Roman Empire, and so what was important was a Latin translation of the New Testament, a Latin translation of the Bible. And this translation then became the most important translation in uh, Europe. It's the one that was most widely used because Latin was the educated language for like a thousand years. Okay? So Jerome translated it. Jerome, the author of the Vulgate, did not want the Apocrypha in his translation of the Bible, but was rather overruled by the councils of Hippo and Carthage. Hippo and Carthage? Who's that? That's Augustine, okay? Small councils with no Hebrew scholars apart from Jerome. Jerome did not translate the Apocrypha, so he did not even translate it. He refused to translate the Apocrypha, yet after his death, the people there in Carthage, they translated into Latin and they appended it to the end of his translation. He did not want that. They went against his wishes. Um, and so we've got the most important translator of the early church saying the Apocrypha does not belong in here. And it was uh, through other means that it got added to his translation. So just because it's appended to that Vulgate in no way means that somehow it's supposed to be there. Um, now here's the big one. So the Catholic Church officially canonized, for all intents and purposes, the Apocrypha in the Council of Trent. Okay? Before the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church taught that the Apocrypha was not to be used for decisions in doctrine. Okay? Now, there's 
a thousand years of Catholic writing. So you can find lots and lots of stuff on, you know, just about every topic out there. But by and large, the general teaching of the Catholic Church was that the Apocrypha was not to be used for decisions in doctrine. For example, Cardinal Cayetan wrote, the rest that is Judith, Tobith, and the book of Maccabees are not canonical. That is not in the nature of a rule for confirming matters of faith. So here's a famous painting of uh, Luther saying, you know, here I stand. And in this famous painting, he is speaking to some, uh, some Roman Catholic leader there. Who is the Roman Catholic leader that he's speaking to? It's Cardinal Cayetan, right? So that's the person that he spoke to. Cardinal Cayetan, the reason Luther is speaking to him, besides the fact that he's a car cardinal, is that he's a brilliant scholar. Uh, cardinal Cayetan was a very important writer, uh, translator, scholar for the Roman church at that time. This is what Cardinal Cayetan himself says, the person that Luther was speaking, you know, taking his stand against when he was on trial. Uh, Cardinal Cayetan, he says this. This is at the close of one of his commentaries. Here we close our commentaries on the historical books of the, is that New Testament? And little things covering it, or Old Testament. I'm sure it's Old Testament. Here we close our commentaries on the historical books of the Old Testament. For the rest, that is Judith, Tobit, and the books of Maccabees are counted by St. Jerome out of the canonical books and are placed among the Apocrypha, along with Wisdom and Ecclesiasticus, as is plain from the Prologus Galateus, Galeatus. Now, according to his judgment in the Epistle of the Bishops, Chromatius and Heliodorus, these books and any other like books in the canon of the Bible are not canonical. That is not in the nature of a rule for confirming matters of faith. Yet, they may be called canonical, that is, in the nature of a rule for the edification of the faithful as being received and authorized in the canon of the Bible for that purpose. So what's he saying there? He's saying they are not canonical and that they cannot be used for determining doctrine. In what sense are they canonical? Canon just means like that it's a rule. In what sense are they canonical? They're useful for daily life, right? They're useful for kind of practical application in life, but they're in the same way that we would say, what's very useful for practical application in life? Small catechism, the table of duties, right? Things like that, uh, that Luther wrote. Those are rules for us, but, and so you might use that Latin word canon, right? But they're not canonical as in authoritative standards for what God has and has not revealed to us. By the help of this distinction, thou mayest see thy way clearly through that which Augustine says and what is written in the Provincial Council of Carthage. And so what's he saying? He's saying, this is how we should understand what Augustine believed, that Augustine didn't actually believe that they were equal in authority to the rest of the Bible, but that they were useful as this kind of rule in daily life. So here you've got Cardinal Cayetan, one of the great minds in Luther's day for the Roman Catholic Church, saying that the Apocrypha is not authoritative. And in fact, the people that in the past we said thought it was authoritative, we got them wrong, including our big hitter, Augustine. Okay? So this is before uh, the Reformation kind of officially kind of uh, separated from the Catholic Church. And this is taking place. You've got Catholic scholars clearly saying it's not authoritative. Now, after Luther, there's a council called the Council of Trent. That council specifically set up doctrines in response to the Reformation or statements in response to the Reformations. The canonization of the Apocrypha at the Council of Trent constitutes an obvious polemic against Protestantism. Trent granted official support to, two, to Second Maccabees for its apparent support of prayers for the dead. So here's the thing. You got Luther. Luther is going to say that the only thing that should count as doctrine, as true scriptural teaching, is something that you can find is based on the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, then it should not be what the church teaches as God's truth. Not in the Bible shouldn't be what's teach, taught as God's truth. Was everything the Catholic Church at that time teaching found in the Bible? Can you name a few things that aren't found in the Bible that the Catholic Church does? Okay, prayers to Mary. 
What else? Purgatory, right? Purgatory is a big one, right? Uh, prayers. What's that? Indulgence, indulgences. Indulgences, right? So the whole kind of process of indulgences, prayers for the dead. So there's all these kind of practices that have snuck into the Catholic Church that there are no basis for in the Old or New Testament. You can't find any references to them in any way, shape, or form. Luther comes along and he says, the church can only teach that which is found in the Bible. So what does the Catholic Church do? They put the Apocrypha in the Bible. <laughs> Why? Because the Apocrypha has a few of the only sections that they can point to to support things like prayers for the dead and, and purgatory as well. It's only in the Apocrypha that these things can be found. Uh, and even there, they're rather veiled. But they need those in order to say that what Luther is doing is wrong. Um, so this is just widely recognized that the canonization of the Apocrypha at the Council of Trent, that that was done specifically because Luther was saying, these things aren't found in the Bible. And so they said, well, we'll make the Bible bigger, <laughs> right? We'll add these books to it. So Luther himself says, I know this is uh, in 19, uh, 1519, his dispute with John Eck. So it's right at the beginning of the Reformation before he's even got all of his own thoughts all figured out. This is Luther. He says, I know that the church retains this book of the Apocrypha. They're talking about a book that's in the Apocrypha, as I just said, but the church is not able to grant more authority or strength to a book than the book has on its own. So Eck, I know that you're quoting from the Apocrypha, right? And I know that the church has kept this book of the Apocrypha around. And so that's why you're quoting from it. But the book cannot have any more authority than the book itself claims for itself. And the books of the Apocrypha do not claim to be inspired scripture. They do not claim to be from the Old Testament prophets. If they don't claim to be that, then you, Eck, you have nothing to stand on here. There's no way that you should be quoting from this. Quote from the apostles and prophets if you want to refute me. That's what Luther is saying here. Um, okay, so with that, we've got... <laughs> Minus one minute. <laughs> Any discussions or questions about the Apocrypha? That's I just had a, one comment. Judy, uh, one comment. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, when you see a grave that says RIP, yeah. you think rest in peace. They think remember in prayers because they're praying for them to get them out of control. I've never heard that. Yeah. Okay. I've never heard that. That's interesting. Yeah. I'd like to look into that. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. My question is, uh, Daniel. Uh, Lieutenant King from if you can speak as uh, loud as possible, because we're. I said, yep. Does it mean that um, Lieutenant Church King from Catholic? Yeah. Right. So Luther was originally a a Catholic Augustinian monk, and a professor in Catholic seminaries. Right. Um. And so that's where his background was from, and so he separated then from the Catholic Church. Specifically because, on the one hand, the Catholic Church was teaching in certain forms work righteousness, that you have to do things in order to make yourself right with God. And indulgences falls into that. That was the big thing that he was struggling with at that time. And what does the Bible teach? The Old and New Testament teaches you are justified through faith, right? Faith alone through Christ. That it is Christ alone that gives you your, your uh, sentence of being just in God's eyes and that faith holds on to it. There are no works involved, right? And so that's Luther's principle number one is that he believes that the Bible teaches that you are saved by Christ alone through faith alone, right? Um, second big thing was his critique of the Catholic church was you are not just looking to the Bible for authority. You are also looking to church councils and to papacies and things like that. The church can only teach what is in the Bible. And what do we not find in the Bible? We don't find these prayers to Mary. We don't find these prayers to Saint. We don't find teachings of purgatory or limbo or any of these other teachings that have come into the church over time. And so Luther said, we need to reform. We need to go back. We need to take these things out of the church and just get back to what the Bible teaches in the Bible alone. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Good. All right, so I will uh, put together a short video going through some of the lost
gospel stuff that uh, I'll put online as I get the rest of these videos up as well. So that if you're interested in that last section, you can see that. But otherwise, we're going to put kind of a close to our discussions or to this Bible study series, uh, The Light in the Dark. Um, hopefully, this has given you just a real good kind of sense of where the Bible comes from, um, especially maybe the last 2,000 years of history, um, uh, how you can explain to someone that you do have God's word, that when uh, you are quoting uh, John 3.16, that when you are telling someone that Jesus has died for their sins, that you can say this is something that God has clearly preserved for us throughout history. I believe this on faith, but if you need more, let's just go and see, right? Let's just go and check out this history for ourselves. So with that, let's end in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us this light in the dark over this past 2,000 years, this light of salvation and peace and forgiveness through Jesus uh, that this dark world desperately needs. And now after this series, I pray that you have impressed in the hearts of all of us just how needed this light is in this dark world. I pray that you use your spirit to motivate us to take this light into the dark lives of the people around us, the people that don't know Christ, that are living in fear of COVID-19, who are living in fear of political turmoil, who are living in fear of their own guilt and sins, uh, who are living just in fear because they do not know whether this is going to end out all right. They do not know whether or not there is a God or whether or not this God loves them. They cannot find a way around their own sinful natures and pasts. And we pray that you help us to take this light, this light of truth, this light that you are a God in control and a God that has a good ending planned through Jesus, that you help us to bring this light into the light of the lives of the people you have given to us. In your name we pray. Amen.